Hi everyone, Dave here. So what is this device in my solar electric hot water tank here? And why did I build it? It's very popular to connect PVDC solar panels directly to a hot water heating tank. But without MPPT, those solar panels will never produce the maximum amount of heat. Such a converter would just spoil the cost effectiveness and simplicity of such setups. Wouldn't it be great if there was a solar electric hot water heating element that could connect directly to solar panels and it had MPPT-like behavior built right in? It could extract nearly the maximum amount of heat from a set of solar panels actively tracking at or near the solar panel's max power voltage almost all day, yet without any MPPT DC converter required. Ideally, it would be cheap and possible for solar DIYers to build themselves. Well, believe it or not, such a thing does exist. It could be called a solid state semiconductor heating element or a diode chain or a diode string. That's right, diodes. Diodes aren't just a one-way valve for electricity. Believe it or not, they can do much more. A string of diodes can make a very efficient and effective self-contained regulated solar electric heating element. In fact, they work so well I use them to heat my workshop because they act very similar to an MPPT DC tracking circuit yet without any of the complexities and costs that MPPT circuits typically have. This video will be quite detailed, but I do recommend checking out my extensive research and work on this topic. Related videos will be linked in the description. It is a fact that properly configured, a diode chain can get more heat from the same solar panels than a typical resistance-based heating element. So far, I have cooked food with diodes, heated my workshop, and heated various hot water tanks, all with direct DC solar electric power, straight from the solar panels. I get many of the benefits of an MPPT DC circuit, but without all the complexity and cost. What we're looking at here is the second version of a prototype solar electric immersion hot water heating element. It uses semiconductor technology. In other words, it's a diode chain. A traditional nichrome or canathol A1 resistance heating element can be directly attached to a solar panel to make heat. For example, in a residential hot water heater. A diode chain heating element is not based on resistance and does not behave like a resistance heating element. Unlike resistance-based heating elements, diode chains have the capability to regulate voltage to a degree. This means when properly configured, a diode chain can be matched to a specific voltage of the solar panel array, typically at or near the maximum power point voltage, or VMP, or VMPP and they will hold this voltage nearly all day, even earlier in the morning and later in the evening. Meanwhile, it extracts almost all the watt hours from a given solar panel throughout the day, which of course manifests as heat, and it does this for cheap. It's so simple to operate. A resistance-based heating element, such as the kind commonly found in hot water heater tanks, can do no such thing. This means the VMP, or max power voltage, cannot be targeted and cannot be tracked. So basically, it means less watt hours, and that means less heat. So those solar panels are not performing at their best. But a diode chain is not based on impedance. Diodes have no significant impedance to current, and they don't behave like a resistor because they're not. So this means you can target a specific voltage with a diode chain. Diode chains are simply more effective at converting solar electric power to heat, whether you need it for cooking, or heating a space, or even heating hot water. I started with a set of small silicon rectifier diodes. I bent the leads into chain links and created quite literally a diode chain. These diodes will be powered by my DC PV to wall solar electric power wall and or a set of common 100 watt 12 volt solar panels with no DC conversion or other circuits. I do have other designs of heating elements such as the kind that is a long coil, but this kind is easier to show on camera and I'm going to stick with it. I started with a piece of 1 inch copper tube with an end cap. I degreased and cleaned the tube and cap of oxidation as much as possible, then I applied a flux paste to ensure a good solid bond. Using a propane torch and silver bearing solder, I soldered the end cap onto the end of the copper pipe. This makes a waterproof container to build my heating element inside of. Then I used fiberglass and other insulation materials and covered the metal leads of the diodes to protect from a short circuit. After that, the diodes can be inserted inside the copper pipe. The connection wires are seen exiting at the top. In hands-on engineering, you will discover everything has trade-offs. Diodes don't like to be too hot. This is one of their downsides. For my builds, I never let the diodes exceed 110 degrees Celsius. In this case, I just need to make hot water for showers and possibly do some thermal storage projects, so even 160 degrees Fahrenheit would be fine. The copper pipe has good thermal conductivity, but we must get the heat out of the diodes and into the water, otherwise the diodes will just burn up. 
We cannot just stuff diodes inside of a copper pipe and expect good results. They will burn up. Now in an early test, I boiled water with some diodes in a jar. Many people stated this was electrolysis, but that's what happens when you jump to an uninformed conclusion. Try sticking your finger in that water. I assure you the water was boiling and there was no electrolysis. That's because I used distilled water. Even so, distilled water is not really a solution and it won't last very long. The bottom line is that any liquid that is not flammable and not electrically conductive could be used. Let's look at some of the options that could potentially be placed inside this tube. First, let's start with some suggestions that came from subscribers. A subscriber suggested using heatsink thermal compound. I'd had that idea as well. At least it's cheap and readily available. And yet another subscriber suggested using hexagonal boron nitride powder. This I am looking into as well. Another one of my ideas was to use magnesium oxide powder inside the tube, much like a traditional stove heating element. I hope this information is helpful to those who want to try making their own semiconductor hot water heating elements. I am using a thermal compound inside of my copper tube. And just a quick note here, diodes do have a temperature profile, which means they vary their behavior depending on their temperature. But with a hot water heater, the water is going to increase in temperature throughout the day. That's the whole point. So what does this mean? It means that no matter how well you match the diodes to the solar panels, the voltage plot throughout the day will always slant a little bit to the right. However, they will still perform better than a standard nichrome heating element. Now the diode chains or diode strings that I use to regulate my solar electric space heaters are not as affected by this because they are cooled by heat sinks and fans. So I've been using this cooler or ice chest to do my hot water heating experiments in. I drilled some holes to run my power wires to the diode chain. The heating element has a piece of flat copper brazed onto it so that I can basically mount it anywhere that I want. I ran my wires through the holes. There will be a total of three wires to start with because I'm going to be using different types of arrangements and solar panels to run the heating element and I want some options and some extra control. Diode chains can be tapped at multiple points throughout to create different voltages and allow for flexibility of operation. One of the problems with a heating element like this is that the hot water is going to tend to want to rise to the top. This is called a thermocline and it can be a real problem if you're trying to generate hot water for say showers and so forth. Time for a real test. The water in this tank is extremely old has been sitting here for months from prior experiments so I swapped it out. In order to accurately measure the temperature of the hot water in this tank, I installed a small brushless DC water pump to mix the water and allow me to use a thermocouple and get a decent measurement. Okay, this is the first test of my semiconductor hot water heater element. You can see the pump down at the bottom. I turn the pump on and this will average out to the correct temperature. Because water tends to stratify and all the hot water is going to be sitting at the top. And it's not accurate to take a measurement that way. I just have this little USB device and it's connected to my solar panels outside. Alright, the pump is on. It's plugged in. Let's see what we're getting for temperatures. 81.82. And of course the heating element is cooling off. But again, that's completely expected. The top of the heating element would be hotter than the bottom. And I'm measuring the top. And we got about 82 degrees for the water. That's 81.8. I'd like to get a couple hundred watts into this uh, hot water tank here. Just to be clear, the thermometer on the left is measuring the top of the heating element. That's measuring my 100 watt solar panel outside. And that's measuring the temperature of the water. There is what it looks like with the pump turned on. You can see it's stirring the water pretty aggressively. Scorn is the end of knowledge and the death of wisdom. Skeptics are a dime a dozen, and being a skeptic is the easiest job in the world. Every skeptic I've met so far doesn't really do anything, they just talk. Whereas I actually work in my workshop. I actually took the time to look into this. I have been able to successfully duplicate the results reported in the scientific paper that is entitled Hot Diodes. I'll put that paper on the screen for you, as well as a link in the video description. I also have a video where I talked about that paper and you may want to check that out as well. The performance of diode chains or diode strings under low light conditions, that means when there's not very good sun or it's overcast, absolutely 
trounces the performance of standard electric resistance heating elements. And no wonder, because diodes are exponential in their behavior and resistance heating elements are linear, as expected. So this is a very important and valid point. It offers a lot of interesting promise for direct solar electric heating applications. Even when the conditions are good, the diode chains have a very flat voltage curve compared to a resistance heating element. A resistance heating element is forced to follow the power curve of the solar panel array, Whereas a diode chain, it's exponential and it is not linear. And that means when there's more power available, the diodes will soak that power up and try to pull the voltage down into the range that you specified. In other words, the max power point or as close as you can get to it. The main problem is we don't have diode packages that are suitable for heating water. And that's no surprise because diodes aren't really considered to be a heating element. The performance of this water tank and these experiments was such that I'm willing to put even more time and effort and money into it and I'm going to build a much more powerful version of it that hopefully will have better thermal interface qualities and will be able to heat a much larger tank of water. And that says it all. The reason why I started looking into diode chains to heat water is because I didn't like the fact that resistance heating elements are so linear. When you're dealing with a dynamic power source such as solar panels, you're almost forced to use MPPT in order to extract the maximum amount of power. But diode chains give you the ability to create a heating element that will extract almost all the power that's available, and yet you don't need a microcontroller or sophisticated electronic circuits, just a string of diodes. And to me, that is amazing. Okay, let's check the system, see how the experiment is going. We have about 203 degrees on the heating element on the hottest part, 118 degrees for the water tank. Still, the diodes are holding around 14.6 volts, which is exactly where I want them. They're like that almost the entire day, with no intelligent MPPT circuit required. No trickery here, I'm not hiding any electronic converter or anything like that. So the water is hot enough I could pretty much take a shower, although I, I want to get it hotter than that. I've put about 0.8 kilowatt hours into this water tank so far in this particular test. Of course, this is leading into other research that I'm looking into, including solar thermal storage, and that's why I'm so interested how many kilowatt hours it takes to heat up this tank. So please subscribe and stay tuned for additional work on sand batteries and thermal storage. The thinner and cheaper the wiring is, the more ohmic behavior you will start to see in the overall system. Due to the way the test is positioned in my shop, I have to use uh, a particularly long cable to get the power over here and I'm pushing about 8 amps over this cable and there is some voltage drop in that cable. I'm well aware of the ohmic behavior of wires and resistors and so it's okay. It's not it's not really damaging my test at all. The solution is just to use good quality wires of a proper gauge for the amount of current that you're trying to push. My hot water heating element could actually be combined with a resistance heating element as well and that would allow me to put less load on the diodes, combine the best properties of these types of heating elements to make a hybrid. So I've already done that with space heating and it works extremely well. Okay, this is an end of day test. As expected, the voltage of the diode chain is maintaining right around 13.3 to 13.6 volts, which is exactly what I targeted. And even at the end of the day, when you're getting virtually no power at all, the diode chain continues to extract heat. Whereas a resistance heating element would have done pull the voltage down pretty much outside the useful range. It would be producing virtually no heat and would be basically useless. There is a little bit of hysteresis, meaning that as the heating element equalizes with the water temperature, the voltage will come up a tiny bit. So what is the take home message here? I have spent hundreds of hours testing diode chains or diode strings in various configurations and using them for various applications experimentally, and my conclusion is that they do have promise for direct PV driven heating applications. In a few places in the world I have seen diode chains applied in a limited fashion for cooking and heating, but I'm sure they will become more prevalent as time goes on. Necessity is the mother of invention. If you like this video and you want to support my work, please consider subscribing, give it a thumbs up, and leave a comment if you have time. Thanks for watching folks and I hope to see you next time.